All right, so good evening and welcome to your library. Um, we are very fortunate and lucky to have a very um, amazing person who not only has lived what she's going to talk to you about and has a lot of expertise and information, and we hope that you enjoy her presentation and follow up with good questions. So, welcome. Here's Grace Kershuni. Thank you, Mirna. It's good to be here in Woodbury, where I feel like I'm among friends. I am among friends. So, that's, that's a good feeling, because I'm not always among friends. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so I will be talking mostly about some of the stuff in my book which is up there, and I have a few copies for sale, and one copy will stay here at the library. And um, so I have been around in Vermont for going on 50 years now. Yeah, really. <laughs> I, I was just an infant. No, I, I was. <laughs> uh, one of the back to the land movements. And, so I and I've lived in Barnet, which is in the Northeast Kingdom, and I'm, all of my homes really have been in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, I've been there since 1984, um, and have have been involved very very involved in the alternative agriculture movement, and uh, really got my education through NOFA, which I hope do I have to explain what that, that acronym means? Okay, that's good. Um, and, you know, worked at various positions in that organization. And one of the positions that I, that I picked up was to be the volunteer who helped develop NOFA's first organic certification program, which was in the 70s. And one thing led to another, and eventually I ended up, um, after the passage of the organic law in 1990, uh, I ended up getting recruited by USDA to come help them write the rules. And therein is the reason for having to tell the story in a memoir. Um, and I chose, a, a, you know, it took me about 15 years from when I left USDA at the turn of the 21st century to, um, to really figure out how to tell the story so that people would get it. Um, and I, it ended up being a memoir. So that's the reason that it is a memoir, that it's telling my own story and the story of the organic movement and how the organic movement became mainstreamed and why that's a good thing. A lot of people think that that's a bad thing and, um, and believe that organic is never going to be you know, good because it's been taken over by USDA. So, in the, in the book, I talk a lot about some of my other involvements, um, particularly the Institute for Social Ecology, which Claudia was integral in. So I'm hoping that everybody else here knows what that is about. Um, and became you know, the person who taught about food system issues and organic gardening and permaculture and stuff like that and, and ended up teaching at Goddard for 10 years in the social ecology program and various other colleges after that, after the affiliation with Goddard ended up, ended um, more, most recently Green Mountain College, which folded <laughs> a couple of years ago. So, um, yeah, so I, I've been involved in one way or another in advocating for food system transformation um, as 
as I see it, the leading edge of the revolution that we all need to have to replace this horribly corrupt capitalist system with something democratic, decentralized, and, uh, and human, uh, you know, really serving human needs. So that's, in a nutshell, um, what, what I've been up to, um, even in my old age, I am continuing to, to work harder than I, <laughs> than I would like to. I, I originally wrote, released this book as, an, as a self-published version in 2016 and spent a lot of energy running around trying to promote it and then um, then after I, I was pretty much ready to just give it up, uh, Black Rose Books, which is a publisher in Montreal that publishes a lot of Murray Bookchin and social ecology oriented books, said, well, we'd like to publish your book. So this, that's what this third edition stuff is about. And this book was released in March of 2020. Uh, we, we had a book launch party in Montreal. And I went home with three boxes of books that I was going to you know, sell at book events. And of course, we know what happened after that. There were no book events and no public anything going on. So I'm really, this is probably the first actual live um, event that I've, in which I've been presenting about the book to the public. It feels very weird. But um, I think it's still very relevant. And the, the stuff I've been involved in more recently has to do with um, food sovereignty, teaching about food and climate justice with my colleague, Brian Tokar, my friend and co colleague. And um, you know, working on a working on a project to really make uh, land access more uh, widely available for people who need access to land and climate refugees, which we expect to be coming to Vermont very soon if they aren't already here. The people who, who really don't have the resources that some of the current climate refugees have. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, organic history. So, um, and I, I don't want to spend more than about another 20 minutes or so all together. So I don't know if anybody wants to like give me a, a five minute warning when it gets to, let's say, half an hour from now. And can, can somebody do that? OK, thank you. Because I tend to go off on tangents. <laughs> and OK, so uh, I only have four slides. And see if it comes up the next one. So I've used this slide a lot um, in my academic stuff. And it's, it's an interesting graphic. Um, and it really tells the story of the various streams of, of thought that went into creating the modern organic movement, as I called it, or MOM. And um, there, there are a lot of different ones that um, I don't think it's very legible, but they, that ended up creating some different streams. Permaculture is one. Um, the uh, biodynamic agriculture was one of the early versions that organic actually evolved from. Um, and, and these days there are even more labels. There are labels upon labels. There are beyond organic labels. There are 
Um, you know, there's resilient agriculture, there's the non-GMO label, um, and all of these things, including the organic label, now that it's USDA approved, um, are oriented towards the marketplace and thereby are very limited in what they can do or mean. Um, and even the ones that, that criticize organic, such as the real organic label, are, um, are still market oriented. They're, they're trying to solve all the problems through the marketplace and that isn't really the, 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 the most effective way of doing that. It is the most effective way of educating a lot of people about what's wrong with the food system. So as I have uh, often argued, the, the, the widespread adoption and, if you will, co-option of organic by, you know, the capitalist system is, has been a very successful um, mass education project that has clued a lot of people into the fact that the rest of the food system is really messed up. I mean, if you can see the same identical sort of junk food or comfort food or, you know, normal food on the shelf, one with a USDA organic sticker on it and one without, and you go, well, you know, the, this one is more expensive, but it's not going to poison me, and it's, you know, not poisoning the planet, and it's not poisoning the farm workers in the fields. You know, it may not be giving them a living wage, but that's, you know, another question. But how come we can have the same food and not have to be poisoning everybody? Uh, so that begins a process, and sometimes it turns people into activists about the food system. And it doesn't always, but it does create a widespread understanding that something has to change about the food system. And I think that that's really given rise to a lot of um, activity and a lot of, um, a, a lot of positive change that, um, that might not happen otherwise. And, um, but it has its limitations, and my slogan for that is, well, you can't dismantle capitalism with a marketing plan. Um, so beyond that, you have to take action, and you have to engage in political action. And that's where the social ecology component of my, uh, my work and my belief system comes in. Um, so. The fact is that a lot of those different claims are taking pot shots at each other and saying, you know, this is, this is a large scale capitalist endeavor and therefore we shouldn't patronize it. And um, this is, you know, other, others are saying, well, it's not pure enough. It doesn't, it, it allows, bad things to be done, even though um, nobody really has scientific proof or evidence about some of these claims. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sort of conjecture about some of this, and the concept of purity is, an, is one of those things that I've, uh, I've fought against for many, many years with my colleagues and friends. Um, and uh, it still seems to take a lot of precedence for some people and in the marketplace it's a selling point. So that's one of the things that, um, that needs to be questioned uh, is the idea of purity. Um, but the thing that keeps me really advocating for it's okay to have large-scale corporate organic because 
of the climate crisis because of climate chaos. And I will go on to the next slide to talk about that. So there's been a lot of work done since the, the advent of the acceptance of organic by USDA, which, by the way, one of my major motivations for agreeing to and supporting the idea of USDA organic is that I, I was um, definitely, you know, I was an organic farmer, market gardener, et cetera, for a while, and then became, got more involved in the education and policy realm of things. But what I was determined is that I wanted to make it so that no organic farmer would ever again walk into an extension office and get laughed at, you know? And that was what was the common experience of organic farmers throughout the country, including in Vermont in the early days. And what year? Huh? So in the early days, what year? Well, I'm talking about the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the early days of my yeah. tenure in Vermont. You know, mm -hmm. there there were a few wonderful, supportive extension agents, and you know, most of them just kind of went <laughs> organic. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And so. That is now the case. Now, you know, every agency of USDA has to be able to offer services to organic farmers. And there's a great deal of money being put into transitioning more farms to organic practices. Um, and I don't care if, you know, personally, I don't care if people don't want to get certified organic. Um, you know, there's there are certain rules about who has to be and how you can use the term. And, you know, so USDA stole organic from the, the movement. I don't care, you know, because, because of all of these reasons, the more acres we can convert to organic methods, even the minimal baseline, the one, the one phrase that I wrote that got that still lives in the organic rules is that whatever practices are done by an organic producer have to be, have to maintain or improve the natural resources of the operation. That means the soil quality, the water quality, biodiversity, um, all of those things that are important have to be maintained or improved and that's not always enforced to the, to the level that we would like it to be, but what it does mean is that, um, for one thing, we're not spreading toxics among, on all those acres, um, which is a big reason for killing off soil health. Uh, we are not spreading dispersing synthetic nitrate on all those acres, which is still considered to be essential for feeding the world by the conventional agriculture. Um, and as some of the, the data that I have seen, um, the manufacture of nitrate fertilizers from, you know, using, without using the bacteria in the soil to do it, um, uses about three to five percent of the natural gas in the world is just for that. And then nitrous oxide is a byproduct of the spreading of nitrate fertilizer. And nitrous oxide is um, 317 times as powerful a greenhouse forcer as carbon dioxide. So it is not an insignificant thing, and it certainly is, is way more of a problem than methane from cows. I'll just put it out that way. Um, so um, th there are all of these other things that um, the grazing of cattle is actually on grass 
um, is actually a net po positive for the climate. Um, and that's becoming more and more um, accepted, even though the feeding of, you know, feeder cattle in CAFOs, confined animal feeding operations, and poultry, and in, in those, you know, industrial animal agriculture is, is a horror show. And that is one of the real, both nutritionally and environmentally, as well as socially, every, every way that you can think of. It's a horror show. Hmm? Ethically. Ethically, yes. Every, every criterion you can think of, industrial animal agriculture, is horrible. Um, and that's why there's been more, you know, a, a big uh, controversy in the organic community about the, the loopholes that allow these large dairy and poultry operations in particular to, to skirt the rules through, you know, clever lawyers. So that's being addressed, but that none of it's perfect. And as the market is, it becomes more attractive and lucrative, there will always be people who try to take advantage of it illegally. And it's, that's the way the capitalist system is set up. So what we need to do is really transform the entire food system, make it locally self-sustaining in terms of the, the necessities in life of life, that all communities should have access to food and water and you know, whatever building materials, fiber that is, that can be produced locally um, and, and processed locally as well. And that's a whole other thing. Pro the infrastructure has become so centralized, um, even dairy, an awful lot of milk gets shipped out of state and then brought back here. It's ridiculous. So, um, so there's a lot of that that isn't part of part of the USDA organic program, but that was part of the original organic movement and still is part of the food justice, food sovereignty is, is another term that's become more popular. And, and it's an international movement. And I won't go into that more, but uh, Brian and I teach the course on food and climate justice and talk about this stuff uh, I think we're going to run the course again in January. It's all online. Anybody can take it. I'll put in that plug. Um, so, and so in other words, you know, when you talk about the the radical restructuring of society, the revolutionary changes that we need, food is very much the pivot point, the the fulcrum on which. Many of us, I mean, food, energy, water, they're all the, the necessities of life. And, and we need to create communities that can provide the support of their populations. And I know that there's folks in this, in this town, in this region, certainly in, where, in uh, the area of the Northeast Kingdom where I live, there's folks working on that. And there's, you know, the, the and Marshfield Cooperation Vermont has taken over the Marshfield Country Store and now um, runs it as a workers' collective and is um, working on grander visions of food sovereignty and land sharing and all of that. Did you know about this? No. You didn't know about this. Yeah, this was started, this was actually um, done through Cooperation Jackson, who the the Jackson, Mississippi folks who are planning on setting up their home base in Marshfield, Vermont, <laughs> and um, yeah, <laughs> just up the road from Van Chodorkoff's. 
Yes. Yeah. A, a lot of amazing things going on. Um, and that's, that's happening in, in inviting more people from marginalized communities, people of color, people, migrant workers, migrant justice, farm workers, and so on. So um, I think I have one more slide. So this is a book that came out recently, and I didn't write it, but I'm, but I'm promoting it because it's really good. Um, and it is really about indigenous agriculture. And so I, I think um, I, I neglected to ask people what it was that was missing from that graphic about uh, the, the evolution of organic. And it was a, my big thought cloud. What's missing from this schematic? What's missing was the fact that all of the all of these practices that are called that were taken by the Europeans who christened it organic agriculture, the Soil Association in the in the UK, which were all by the way fascists, <laughs> out and out supporters of Mussolini. Um, at the time, not all of them, because Sir Albert Howard, who was considered the, really the father of organic agriculture, um, who was a British um, colonel, I believe, stationed in India for many years and did a lot of his observations about the soil and health um, by studying what the Indian peasants taught him. The, the, the composting method that we all associate with the Rodale layering and piling and all of that was taught to Sir Albert by the Indian peasants and he actually acknowledged this fact. So the indigenous practices, ancient indigenous practices all over the world, F.H. King who was a USDA soil scientist who visited Asia in the early 20th century wrote a classic book called Farmers of 40 Centuries where he detailed the practices of the Chinese and Southeast Asian peasantry that were that kept the soil fertile for you know 40 centuries thousands of years um, similar things in South America and the ancient indigenous practices, Mesoamerica, some of the, the many of the practices that were um, considered, um, that, that are considered permaculture ideas came out of um, the Chinampas systems in, in Latin America. Um, and in the Australians, you know, the Aborigines had their own systems and the desert dwellers of the American Southwest had their systems and we are learning from the Abenaki people in this part of the world about some of the heritage agricultural systems that they practiced and they definitely did practice agriculture. Um, so we need to work on what on what's going on in our own backyards. And we have to question the, the colonial mindset. The, the settlers who, the white settlers who came and said, oh, there's no agriculture going on here. This is wilderness. We're all, you know. No, it was all very well managed. And it was very well managed. And Liz Carlisle is, has documented these stories in this book of different indigenous uh, descendants who are scientists. They're not, they're not like, you know, wild people living on reservations who are just doing the old ways. They are scientists who are very accomplished and well um, doing things in a rigorous manner, showing how many of these indigenous practices are absolutely the most appropriate things for the particular ecosystem in which they are located. Um, 
but I, I really liked that particular quote because it's all about the web of relationships. And it's all about, as we, one of the organizations I've been involved with pretty closely for the last few years is the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition. And I would put in a plug for anybody interested in all of this stuff to join the listserv. That's where stuff happens. There, we've had educational programs and some wonderful videos of some of these educational programs are up on the website. Um, and uh, so we talk about building the social mycelium because it's all about the fungal mycelia that keep the soil healthy, that, trans that, that that's like an underground mutual aid network for, for plants uh, and animals. And that we, we, we have to have animals for a healthy ecosystem as well. So, you know, indigenous knowledge and indigenous ways of knowing, which really, um, which really gets beyond the, the purely rationalistic, scientific methods uh, and understandings that may or may not be replicable in field plots, but speak to a, an intimate connection to a place and to the spirits of the place and to the, the and sees the whole world as alive and sentient. The trees, the rocks, the rivers, the lakes, it's all, um, it, it, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the book Braiding Sweetgrass, but that book is, is when we asked um, the presenters in, our, in the soil series that we did a couple of years ago for the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition, we asked them to recommend books that they thought everybody should read, and like half of them or more said Braiding Sweetgrass. So that really presents the indigenous worldview from the perspective of a real scientist who is able to eloquently explain why these things work and what is important. Um, so I'm another, another plug for understanding the other ways of knowing. And that's, that's really what I'm talking about. So I might, I'll, I'll conclude with um, a little reading from my epilogue, which, you know, I wrote in 2016, um, which I entitled Advice to a Young Food System Activist. Um, and so I, I Hopefully this won't, yeah, this is like about a page or so. So here it is. My life has been devoted to healing the earth and simultaneously human bodies, individual and collective, assaulted by toxic pollutants in the 20th century. The same strategy that can remove the toxins from air, water, soil, and food can also help restore the critical metabolic balance of CO2 levels in our planetary respiration pathways. This virtuous cycle is known as organic agriculture. And so once again, as I finish telling the story of my own journey along this path, I rededicate what remains of my own life to promoting the widest and fastest possible adoption of organic methods as they may be adapted to work within the particular human culture and ecology where they are practiced. This means political, economic, and social revolution, by the way. To the young farmers and food system activists who must carry this work forward on the ground, I hope the lessons embedded in my story will prove beneficial. In case my message has been too subtle, here are a few important points to keep in mind. Basic goodness means there is no us and them. We're all in this together and have to unlearn habits of thought that see any human being, not to mention any other species, as alien or other. 
that is assumed to be a threat. That our Western capitalist political economy is predicated on such beliefs is the dirty secret that is now, with this resurgence of movements such as Black Lives Matter, being exposed repeatedly. The enemy is not other people. The enemy is racism and all its related isms that allow any fellow human to be brutalized for the sake of our own need for security and comfort. I have long campaigned against the demand for purity in the context of organic food and farming. This is related to my gut reaction to the demand for purity advocated by the openly racist segments of society, most especially the Nazis who were the evil boogie persons of my childhood. My feminist and sexual liberation impulses are similarly repulsed by the repression of women in the name of virginal purity and beyond that its connotations of whiteness and refinement, which brings us to the connection between food and racism. The story of sugar in a way encapsulates the horrific consequences of the quest for purity in the food system. A similar story could be told about the fate of our major cereal grains, especially corn, wheat, and rice, in which whiteness and purity have been valued to the detriment of health and nutrition. Not to mention cotton, the foundation of industrialization of the West, built on slave labor that was justified in the minds of its perpetrators by relegating its victims to less than human status. As impurities have been refined out, the social status of foods such as white sugar, white flour, and white rice has been elevated, while at the same time, their life-giving qualities have been diminished. The addictive qualities of both refined carbohydrates and refined hydrocarbons is not a coincidence. That the production, processing, and manufacture of foods and textiles from these now lifelessly pure products is predicated on an exceptionally vicious dehumanization of brown and black people by those of Caucasian descent is a shameful and sordid chapter of our history that lives on at the very core of our so-called civilization. So the demand for purity is antithetical to the need for health. Purity requires monoculture. Purity rejects our symbiotic relationship with the teeming microbiome that contributes the huge majority of our metabolic well-being, but instead strives for an illusory sense of germ-free safety. But some purity can be good and beautiful, the rare and exquisite product of well-crafted artifice. That's a different aspect that we should not forget any more than we should turn the tables on racists by making them into the enemy. Any more than we should seek to eliminate CO2, a waste product and pollutant in excessive levels from our atmosphere or our bloodstream. Much of the damage to the true organic vision, as I have tried to elucidate it, has been done by those who earnestly believe that organic food must be pure that ideological purity must trump political compromise. To overcome this belief, we need compassion for our own inner fascist. At this moment, it is critical to the health of our Gaian respiratory metabolism that we freely share this vision with everyone, even those whose political views or position of extreme wealth and power we may despise. The hour is late. Do as much as you can, but learn to be patient. Be kind, but be persistent. That's. And you have a great sense of time. Because that's exciting. I guess. I, thank you. So, I'm sure people must have some questions. Thank you for this. I, I do. Yeah. Like three or four years. Has notes. <laughs> Are you a journalist? Um, no. <laughs> okay. well, I, I take like notes and then I throw it out. <laughs> How I remember. No. Um, so I'll start hopefully with an easy one. I just read an article today that the USDA has, USDA has created a people's community garden list and people register their gardens or community gardens register and they're keeping a list. 
that's not ringing any bells for you. Oh. you know, I mean, there is a People's Garden in Washington at the USDA headquarters, which mm -hmm. supposedly is being managed organically now. <laughs> okay, well, I, it was just something I, I just ran across. And I'm like, what is that? And I'm not, re I'm not registering my garden. No way, no how. Um, my, my garden is it, it, large for me. It's like 30 by 60. Mm -hmm. and it's been, always been an organic garden and always grew plants because I enjoyed them, growing things. And, and now that I have turned my health around and I am now whole food plant-based, no added salt, oil, or sugar, and no processed foods, and at the moment I'm not eating any animal products either, um, for health, my health, it's, you, there's too many calories in a piece of steak, I can't, you know. <laughs> I, w I will not get into <laughs> the diet. Yes, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not asking you to, but, but just to show you where I'm coming mm -hmm. from, I'm new to this, mm -hmm. I'm like, my one year anniversary for flipping my lifestyle around comes November 1st. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, you know, I've done, I've, I do so much reading. I, I That's to, good. It's good, it's good, but you run across bizarre things. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and one thing which I don't think it's particularly bizarre, because Bill Gates is involved in it. Uh-oh. Yeah. yeah. That's, lab, that is bizarre. Yeah. Lab-grown meat. Oh, boy. I could go on about that. Could you just give me just a little bit there, or, uh, uh, where you are with that? A different point of view from his? Bad. That's okay. <laughs> Very bad. That's how I feel. Yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm like... <laughs> the book I am reading right now, which may which has a somewhat offensive title to some people, is called The Great Plant-Based Food Con. And that, that's a major piece of it, is the idea that lab-grown meat is better and that plant-based meat substitutes are going to save the planet. It is complete hooey. Um, and I could go into the reasons for that, but just, you know, a, a small piece of that is that um, it's all genetically engineered, using, d depending on genetically engineered uh, feedstocks. It is, yeah. Well, it's processed. And it's highly processed. <laughs> like, what the heck? It's, and it's highly processed, it's highly capital intensive, mm -hmm. it's highly centralized and it's highly um, 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 intellectual property based, right? Meaning that it's all patented stuff. Yeah. That Energy intensive? Well, I would think so. All, 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 most assuredly, you yeah. Have to keep, you have to keep this Petri dish meat 98.6 degrees. Oh, yeah. yeah you have to, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, it, and it's all fed by, you know, industrial agriculture. And so I'm assuming that eating, uh, turning bugs into our protein source is kind of in the same category? Um, not necessarily. I mean, there's a lot of indigenous cultures that use insects as food sources, and, and it's a perfect, you know, just about anything that's, you know, mass produced and industrialized that otherwise is a, is a you know, nutritious traditional food is going to be compromising the quality, the nutritional quality, as well as the whole you know, political and economic aspects. So, you know, I think this is this is where the the problem with you know organic as an industrialized system is manifest. And there's no question that I mean I I also continue earning money by doing organic inspections and I do organic inspections of only processors. So I, I get to visit these giant factories that make stuff like chocolate <laughs> and coffee and what was the last one? Oh, um, hummus, you know, whatever. You know, all of these things that we think are very good and, and many of them are 
very, I mean, they're very conscientious and follow the rules and make a quality product. And within this, within the political economy we have now, it's good. You know, I, I'm not going to knock these people. They're they're doing a good job and they care. But it isn't. Um, it is still compromising in many ways that we wouldn't compromise with a local product made in, you know, small facilities like the Center for Ag Economy in Hard in yeah, it's in Hardwick, which which are doing great things with locally processed foods. So we do need an infrastructure. We do need, you know, people who can do all of this sort of larger scale processing and do it in a in a conscious way. Um, I'm, I'm not sure where I'm heading with that, but hopefully I've answered your question. Well, you, give me a lot, you give me lots to see. <laughs> One more, well, maybe sure. two more. But anyway, um, <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, the bag of. I'm just going to use potato chips, and I can't eat them anymore. Sometimes I think about them. But you've got you got one bag Lay's potato chips, and then another one with that organic on it. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's more expensive. And so, um, you know, the Buffalo Mountain Co-op has just purchased the market, and mm -hmm. I volunteered yeah. there helping them move. And, and I'm I gave with them money to help <laughs> do it. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm thrilled with the new space yeah. and, and everything, but. You know, it's it's kind of a shock going from what the co-op was to what it is now, mm -hmm. and you see these products now side by side, and I'm you know okay with that because um, I don't buy either of them anymore. Yeah. If it's processed, organic or otherwise, yeah. I don't buy it because I will gain weight back, and mm -hmm. so I just stay away well, we, from it. And we just have to we I'm just remembering all the conversations we had about the definition of processed. But that's, <laughs> yeah, 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 well, it's... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it... it to me, it, it's it's processed. Yeah, as well, like no, I, 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 You know, you can't get around it. Highly processed. Highly processed. Yes. And, I'm, you know, I worry that, that the flavor of the co-op will be changed by it unless, you know, people really try to to hang on to that. But, I mean, the old co-op had the chips there as well. Just the lays weren't next to them, so... Well, you know, and again, this is, illustrates how... I think it's a good thing that people who would never go into the Buffalo Mountain Co-op as it was will go in there and yeah. buy their groceries and look, see these things side by side on the shelf and go, well, that's, you know, that's weird hippie food, but it looks just like the potato chips I like. <laughs> you know, My tribe I think yeah. probably Lay's even has an organic brand. Probably. They probably do. I mean... Doritos does, I think, or you know, they, they, they all do. They all want to cash in on this trend, mm -hmm. and they, you yeah, know, anyway. Okay. So one, one last thing. Sure. Um, I think the term I want to mention is regenerative farming, using mm -hmm. animals as part of that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Because um, mm -hmm. I, w I went to a center and spent seven weeks did a twenty day wire fast, and this, this, this ideology. They're vegan, but almost. I mean, in California. In California. Yeah, True oh. North Health Center in California. Okay. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I'm not ideologically a vegan. I okay, have that's no good. <laughs> moral compunction about eating cow. Okay. Not yet. Maybe they'll convert me yet. Who knows? But it's it's health I'm concerned with right now, and, and I regain that and revisit it. But um, so my garden I mentioned is organic. I'm still going to use composted cow manure to mm -hmm. to because the soil. And my garden is well fed and well cared for. I may have a big square garden, but I have a massive garden. It grows massive plants. And uh, that's wonderful. And, and, and I look at this, sometimes I look at other gardens and I'm like, why is mine so big? Oh yeah, because I really pay attention to the soil. So part of that saving the planet would include animals in your point of view. Absolutely. As opposed to the one I learned out there, which we get our people off, off cows and we'll save the climate. That is a myth. Okay. That is a, a myth that I think, I consider to be a dangerous myth because, um, and there are a number of books that I could direct you to. I mean, Cows Save the Planet, 
uh, is one of them. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I actually did study holistic management with Alan Savory, who, um, whose commitment really is to saving the planet and, is, and that the use of grazing animals is absolutely essential to building soil. So the, the, um, the Great Plains co-evolved the, the, the incredibly deep soil in the grasslands of the Great Plains co-evolved with the buffalo and could not have, and that's true of all of the great plain, plains uh, grasslands throughout the world, and that the key to reversing desertification, particularly in places where it's desertifying and it's happening rapidly in many places, is to introduce massive herds of grazing animals. And Alan Savory has proved this out in the farm that he owns, that he started in Zimbabwe, which is where he came from. He was a white Rhodesian wildlife biologist. And so the, the key to reversing climate change, in my opinion, is really um, building soil, restoring the water cycles, and the soil and water are hand in hand. And, and, it, and there must be contact of animals with the soil in order for that to happen. They, they are the recyclers. So yeah. they are the, the and, um, you know, they, they are capable of moving fertility from the lowlands to the uplands when they go up, up to the hills to graze and poop, you know. So yeah. that's... My brain would get stuck on no cows. Okay, so how do you build the soil? Because I'm a savage gardener back in this little tiny Vermont, and I'm just like going, okay, I don't see how you can do that. Oh, I get hay, and I can use apples. And no, you really need that. I mean, they're they're reclaiming some even some of the Sahara with regenerative farming. Yep. Anybody else have some questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm done too. <laughs> I was just wondering how are potato chips highly processed? Well, you know, I don't think they are. Well, you take a whole food, which is a potato, yeah, and um, it gets, in many cases, are like Pringles, for example. I'm are not talking the, about Pringles. I'm right, talking about potato chips. Potato chips. Well, I mean, they're they're sliced up and cooked in oil and done, you know. So I'm not saying they're not good for you. Yeah. Uh, they're probably not, but, but they I don't, don't know seem to be, they seem to be less processed, say, than a loaf of bread. That's true. Bread is highly processed, especially, but, you know, there is a difference between, you know, your local restaurant that does hand-cut potato chips from using fresh potatoes to start out with and you know, that's, what's the difference? You'd say, well, you know, there are things that go on in huge factories that involve, you know, using a lot of um, oils that may not be healthy and... Preservation methods. Yeah, I mean, and, and sometimes, you know, it's not so bad and, and the highly processed category is, can be, you know, not so awful, depending on how it's done. But in general, you know, if you want to avoid anything that's going to be detrimental to your health, you, you know, it's wise to stick with as close to whole foods as possible. And there's, you know, there's a whole school of thought that considers bread to be terrible just because the grain is smashed up, whether it's done in a home flour mill or in a giant mill somewhere. Um, so, I, and I'm, again, I'm not going to make, cast aspersions on anybody's dietary choices, but 
people who want to eat as close to the natural level as possible. Sometimes, I mean, there's extremes of any kind are not, you know, purity. Mm -mm. We don't want it. We don't need purity. <laughs> Diversity your, is good. Your hair back is... Oh, on my... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> not used to it. <laughs> um, so, that's, that's essentially it, you know. All things in moderation, including moderation. I don't know what that is. <laughs> that's... <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, there there are advocates and and purists of all kinds, and if you're if you're reasonably careful and conscious about what you're eating, um, you know, omnivory is is to be preferred, in my opinion. If it's not too big of a question, but could you go over how do we sequester the carbon just by gardening? Okay. And, you know, again, just by keeping the soil from yeah. just flowing away. Well, that's away. certainly one way. I one mean, way. soil organic matter is the is the carbon storage. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's all different levels of storage. So it's it's complicated in a way because. Um, you know, some of that organic matter is recycled and, and you, you know, burned, if you will, by the soil biota to feed the plants and, to, and, and some of it goes back out as carbon dioxide. There's a carbon cycle that's a natural thing. But then um, the deeper into the soil profile it goes, the more, the more stable it is. So, the the car, the organic matter that's near the surface of the soil, is more likely to be cycled through. Um, but as you accumulate more organic matter, and it goes to deeper levels, um, and the roots of the plants go deeper and deeper, and the and the fun, fungi send their mycelia deeper and deeper, then more of it gets stored in a stable form. And when it's, once it's there, I mean, sometimes uh, humus can be, can be there for thousands of years um, and not be mineralized and, and other, you know, their intermediate forms. So, the whole idea, I might make some mention of the carbon credits thing because that's becoming a thing in the carbon markets for agriculture. Farmers are, are beginning to see payment for carbon sequestration. And the ways of measuring the carbon can be a little dicey. And so sometimes you know, some of these schemes are just more capitalist market manipulations that really don't mean anything because they're they're not they're not measuring the long term stored carbon, they're just measuring the changes in the upper levels of the soil and they're not you know, it's just more complicated than that, you know. So you can't reduce it to a to a single number. So is it help? wise to not when you're breaking soil not to till very deep? Um, Just to well it is actually uh, one of the the uh, the soil health principles to avoid disturbing the soil at all as much as possible. So no till Farming and gardening is becoming more of a thing, and it's not an easy thing to do. But some of the old, you know, the Ruth Stout method with, you know, deep level of mulch permanently is is one way that you protect the soil. Uh, 
green growing roots in the soil for as long as possible in the growing season is another thing that builds soil. So because the roots stay in the soil and the, they feed the microbes and um, you know there's this whole li the liquid carbon pathways where the plant takes in the CO2 and converts it to carbohydrates which it then trades to the mycorrhizae fun fungi for other nutrients that the mycorrhizae can go over here and look for water or phosphorus and that that the plant may need and you know there's there's an amazing and then we're learning more and more about this stuff all the time I mean when I went to UVM and studied soil science it was you know it was kind of not really known much and now everybody's talking about mycorrhizae and fungi and, and keeping the fungi to bacteria ratio high enough and all of that stuff and and all of that is really you know soil health is is not so simple it's a big ecosystem it's a very complex ecosystem and it's really mirrored by our inner microbiome very much so so you know so people who who eat from a local garden will have a microbiome that very much mirrors the microbiome in the soil. Yeah? I read somewhere that 98% of the world's topsoil has been lost over the centuries. Well, I don't know where the 98% figure, but there's definitely a, a, high, a high number. Um, and in different places it's, it's more and other places less, but, you know, a lot of topsoil has been lost, <laughs> especially since the advent of the plow. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, healthy soil means carbon sequestration in the soil, which offsets greenhouse gas emissions, is that correct? Well, I mean, some in the, in the marketplace where there are where there's things like people selling carbon credits as offsets, um, that would be a, an accurate term. And so that is actually being done, that people are selling carbon credits to offset somebody getting to pollute somewhere else, which somehow or other doesn't make sense to me. But that's, that's the way that works. Um, but really, you know, healthy soil is the foundation of, um, of how we turn around climate chaos. And it's not just, I, I, I'll just have to get on this bandwagon a little bit more because it's not just about the carbon. Carbon is, is a convenient, metric because it, it's easy to measure and it's definitely related to the, the atmospheric um, issues. But the far greater greenhouse gas is water vapor, <laughs> right? And if the water vapor stays up in the air and it doesn't fall as rain, that's what really drives global warming. And healthy soil and healthy plants revive those water cycles so that it rains in the right in the in the right amount where it's needed. And you know, there's a whole. I mean, there's um, there's a wonderful book. Judith um, Judith Schwartz is an author who lives in Bennington, I believe. <coughs> And she's written some fabulous books about these subjects. And the most, not the most recent one, but one that I have read that is really excellent is called Water in Plain Sight, which talks about how the, how the soil and water and regenerative practices. And she's followed Alan Savory around in, the, in Africa and, and really chronicled 
how restoring healthy soil also restores the water cycles and makes it rain where it's needed and um, and brings you know the great the great um, atmospheric <coughs> rivers of places like the Amazon um, brings those cycles back into balance which are totally off kilter right now. <coughs> Anything else? You, you make me wonder how much of this stuff that we attribute to climate change is really related to how the soil has been Absolutely. deteriorated Absolutely. or compromised. I, I, would, I would say that the, I mean, I have a slide that I didn't use tonight that I, essentially, you know, the food system, agricultural system is, generally considered to be responsible for about, you know, between a third and a half of climate chaos, of the greenhouse gases, and that, and more so than the transportation system. Yeah, I look at a cornfield, a generic cornfield, mm -hmm. and the way that's done, and something just doesn't seem right about it. The way the soil's laid bare all winter long. To, oh, yeah. And, and the way they, apply, even in Vermont, the way they applied the manure. Mm -hmm. So it just doesn't seem, when you figure the middle well, of the Well, and then you've got it, the phosphorus going into Lake Champlain right. and then all the other water bodies around here. And you figure the entire middle of our continent, the Midwest and eastern part of the Great Plains, it's all plowed once a year. At least once a year. Right. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, we could get into the, the the no-till using genetically modified seeds and glyphosate, which. Oh gee. Yeah. <laughs> which doesn't really help much, and. No. Yeah, <laughs> but well, at least they're not tilling the soil, and that you know that's. Monsanto or Bayer now tries to sell that as. Sustainable. But then you got to wonder what what's the effect on the the, the fungi in the soil. Oh, you don't have stuff. to wonder. It's, <laughs> you know, it, it's bad. I mean, it, glyphosate kills fungi. Gly glyphosate kills everything. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. Glyphosate's bad shit. I mean, really, and uh, I don't want to go into it because it makes me depressed. I mean, now we've got. PFOAs and the forever chemicals that are in everything, and 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 it gets spread on farmland in municipal sludge. Oh, geez, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Microplastics, right? And micro. I mean, so you know, essentially we're screwed. <laughs> but. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, but we can maybe. we we can do various things to remediate we this do, stuff. We can do better. We and can totally. do better, and it's not totally too late. It may be too late in some places, but you know it can be reclaimed, and I think that that's the 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 hopeful message. I hope that I am offering it. It is possible, and but it can't be done without massive restructuring of the whole social ecosystem and you know and I mean I don't think there's really any way of avoiding it because avoiding massive devastation and suffering because it's it's happening now right. it's already happening right. yeah. and um, and it's it's going to continue happening, but there are there are islands, there are people who are definitely working on regenerating not just the soil but the water, the and the social systems, and that's all equally important. It's all interrelated. 
Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, it's really capitalism that's killed the planet. It's killing the planet, and it's, um, and it is not necessarily conspiracies. It's not conspiracies. It's a systemic belief that money, money, and um, and the the, the 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 willingness to, you know, to exploit both the earth and other people. Is there enough land to reclaim to feed the population of the planet? More than enough. I mean, the, the population of the planet is, there's enough food being produced right now to feed the population of the planet. There's no, there is no food shortage. It's just being, it's not being distributed. It is, well, it's, it's because it's on the market. It's, it's based on a market economy. And if people are, don't have access to land to produce their own food, they have to buy it. And they don't have any money because they've, you know, duh, right? So that's why access to land and, and food sovereignty for communities is ultimately crucial because if we can survive without the capitalist economy then it will eventually collapse and it's collapsing already. Right. Well, the capitalist economy seems to be teetering on the brink right now. Right. Right. So and that that's going to create even greater suffering for people who, for the vast majority of people who are totally dependent on buying food in the marketplace. But that's what might instigate the change that we all hope for. I mean, it won't be pretty, but... Right. Well, I mean, the, the, the conflict in Syria, for example, back in whenever it was, we lose track of time at this age, don't Still you? Still is. <laughs> Still is. Um, was essentially instigated by the, by a massive drought that's still happening in that part of the world that forced a lot of peasants and farmers into the cities where they were unemployed and had no food, and that's where the great Arab Spring uprisings were generated from. So yeah, it's happening, and you know you can't separate out the the environmental from the economic from the social crises that are that are all happening together because of the interconnectedness. Yeah, yeah. So you know everybody can do whatever they can in whatever way they can, and it's fine. It isn't. No, like I'm, this is my message to myself. I don't have to save the world, <laughs> you know. Um, and none of us can do it alone. No. I want to thank you. I yeah. don't want to keep you too long, but I do want to ask if you could put uh, explain a little bit that nonprofit that you mentioned in the beginning that had some connection to Marshville. Oh, Cooperation it. Vermont. Yeah, could you just explain um, just a little bit about I, Well, they, um, this, this collective of people who are, um, you know, so many of them are people of color, mm -hmm. are worker, workers cooperative, mm -hmm. and the Marshfield Country Store, which was, I guess, on the market, was purchased by this group um, that was sponsored by the folks from Cooperation Jackson. All right, yeah, that's the group who, Cooperation, Cooperation Jackson. Jackson who are from Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. which has been in the news a lot lately mm -hmm. because of the failure of their water system. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
So that those folks have been coming to Vermont for a few years now and um, kind of setting up camp at the Grassroots Center for Organizing in Marshfield, which, you know, Henry Harris is... Anyway, <laughs> so this is a farm that's being converted into a radical agricultural project with I, I, I guess I don't really want to try to explain it because sometimes it isn't what it seems but <laughs> but anyway the, the cooperation Jackson folks have been hanging out there and then and and um, they working with the group called the People's Network for Land and Liberation created this Cooperation Vermont analog which has the mission of you know radically restructuring the this community food system to make it to bring about resilience and to be able to integrate the whole community and, and the the manager of the store who's part of this collective she's a pretty amazing character um, was just saying you know she's she wants the, the the store to be sort of like the new Buffalo Mountain Market. It's got the usual stuff that people expect to see, and the community feels comfortable coming in there. All kinds of people come in there and get their coffee and lottery tickets and junk food, and they make a lot of pizzas and you know that kind of thing. And also, you know forms the basis for being able to have conversations with people who maybe have different political viewpoints than the people who are running the store. But so that's So the link to Mississippi is just that they are from Mississippi? Well some or how does that there are some of the people there who are, but the I mean I'm not really sure, but the folks from Mississippi helped start it okay. and found it. And they're it. organized around the water issue in Mississippi. Well, they're organized around a lot and of many other issues. Yeah, the food, food sovereignty and um, racial justice and mm -hmm. all of that. I mean, they there's there there's some really good videos available now and there's actually going to be a fundraiser for the Jackson water system for Cooperation Jackson in Burlington on October 22nd and I, I can circulate more information about that um, because they're they're building a, a water catchment system for Jackson for the for the neighborhood where they are based so that people can at least have some access to water when the mm -hmm. municipal system goes down the drain. <laughs> All right, thank you. And you have books available? I have I books available. Can and I will the sign board. them, um, 20 bucks. And I. And if you, I've already given you one, so you know. <laughs> what's, your, what's your email, please? Um, well, I, I have an organic revolutionary at gmail.com, which is probably easier than spelling my name, but it's okay, also my, my, my full name with no punctuation marks at gmail.com is also, Claudia has my email. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me.